Greetings. This week's video, we will look at some of the local factors which determine wound healing. Now, there are a multitude of factors, systemic and local, which determine wound healing. And some of these factors are wound specific. For example, for venous leg ulcers, one local factor that one has to um, control is leg edema to facilitate wound healing. For arterial ulcers, one has to optimize arterial blood supply. But there are three local factors which are common to all of the wounds regardless of the underlying etiology. And that's what we are going to focus on today. Before we do that, let's recap briefly what we discussed in our previous video. Previous video was titled Pressure Ulcer Staging. We determined that the terminology pressure ulcer has now been changed to pressure injury. And there are four types of pressure injuries from stage one to stage four. And we looked at different layers of soft tissues covering the bony skeleton and determined that as the depth of the wound increases, so does the staging. But it's not the numerical depth that determines the stage of the ulcer, but the deepest tissue type exposed. And that's an important concept because there are some pressure injuries which may appear shallow, but could be of a higher stage. And others may appear deeper, could be of a lower stage. Now let's see if we can stage the following pressure injuries if we know the types of tissues exposed. For also one, 90% of the exposed tissue is dermis and 10% is fat. For also type two, 80% of the exposed tissue is dermis and 20% is fascia. For also candidate number three, 70% of the exposed tissue is non-blanchable erythema of the epidermis and 30% is the joint capsule. Our last candidate, also four, is only 0.2 centimeters deep. That's two millimeters deep. The location is the extensor surface of the elbow, back of the elbow only two millimeters deep. The tissue components are 50% dermis and 50% ligaments. So now that you know the tissue types exposed, let's see if we can stage them. The answers to all of these are in our first video. So if you look at the first video, you will be able to stage all of these pressure injuries. So let's now um, talk about uh, three local determinants of wound healing. There are a multitude of factors, local factors, that determine wound healing, and some of them are related to the underlying etiology of the wound. For example, uh, with venous ulcers, one has to control local edema to augment wound healing. But there are three factors that generally can be applied to almost any wound and we'll focus on those. Factor number one, optimal moisture control. Now for wounds to heal, there must be some moisture. There is this one thought process which says, well, you can dry wounds out. And I've heard this from medical professionals and from patients. Oh, we used to dry our wounds out. Why are you doing all these dressings? Well, let's go back and uh, look at the types of wounds that people used to dry out. Most of the time, these were superficial wounds such as abrasions, road rash. So what's an abrasion? You have exposed dermis, you get a little exudate, inflammatory exudate, mixed in with some cells, protein, the water dries out, and it forms a scab. Underneath the scab, the wound tends to heal. 
But if you look at the layer immediately underneath the scab, there will be a layer of moisture. So what does that tell you? It tells you the wound, that any wound requires moisture to be healed. Even the ones that you dry out. What you're doing is you're creating an impermeable layer of scab on the surface of the wound to retain moisture. So drying out wounds is one way of creating an impermeable moisture barrier. But do you really want to dry out complex wounds? Wounds with exposed muscle, exposed subcutaneous fat. So what happens when you dry out the surface layer of the wound? You dehydrate the cells. 70% of the cell volume is water. So when the surface of the wound is fat, or dermis, or muscle, or maybe any other tissue component, you dry it out, you kill those cells. So what you're telling the body is this, hey, guess what? I'm going to kill viable tissue to form impermeable leathery barrier so we can retain a layer of moisture underneath, i.e. we need moisture for the wounds to heal. So how does one assess wound moisture to see if it's to see if there's optimal moisture for the wound to heal. Number one, look at the surface of the wound. If it's dry, desiccated, that means the surface cells are dehydrated. Now you have a layer of non-viable tissue on the surface of the wound because it's dried out. The other way to uh, assess moisture is to look at the drainage of the dressing removed. There may be scant drainage on the dressing, but the wound may still be moist. Mild drainage when there's about 25% of the dressing saturated. Moderate drainage, 25 to about 50 to 75%. And large amount of drainage when the entire dressing is saturated with exudate. Now these are just guidelines, okay? You can also look at the surrounding tissue for evidence of maceration. The moisture level of the wound will determine the type of dressing you do. Wounds may be dry for a number of reasons. For example, patients may have poor PO intake or they may be going, undergoing excessive diuresis. If the wounds are dry, you want to do a dressing that does not absorb moisture from the wound cavity. You want dressings that retain moisture, such as a telfa dressing. And if you are packing the wound, then you may want to pack it with a neutral dressing, such as Vaseline gauze type of dressing. Because Vaseline gauze does not absorb moisture, it's covered with a thin layer of Vaseline, which repels water. So water is repelled into the wound cavity, not absorbed from the wound cavity. If, on the other hand, you have wounds with large amount of exudate, you want dressing to absorb the excess exudate. So one may pack the wound with alginate to absorb the exudate, and your secondary dressing may be a foam dressing. Second factor that determines wound healing is microbial load, i.e. if the wounds are infected. Now, first, wounds are never sterile. Wounds have bacteria in them, but they are not infected. Same way that your skin has a layer of bacteria, but your skin is not infected. Over a period of time, in some wounds, the bacteria can actively replicate, multiply, and critically colonize the wound, i.e the microbial load increases. So how will you determine by looking at the wound if it's critically colonized? Well, look at some of the clinical signs which include exudate. A previously wound with a low amount of exudate has now a large amount of exudate. Second, odor. There may be wound odor. Thirdly, Wounds may have friable granulation tissue, may bleed easily. So even though you may have granulation tissue, 
which is a sign of wound healing, if it becomes friable, that means it's infected. Fourthly, the wound may stop healing. So these are the early signs that wounds may be getting critically colonized. If you miss those early signs, then, you, then the bacteria begins to invade, invade the surrounding soft tissues, the healthy tissues, and you get cellulitis, erythema, and induration around the wounds. But ideally, you want to assess microbial load before you get to local tissue infection, surrounding tissue infection. So look for signs of critical colonization. So in addition to uh, looking at uh, moisture level of the wound and microbial load, one also has to look at the presence of non-viable tissue. Non-viable tissue impedes wound healing. Look, you have a wound cavity that needs to be filled with granulation tissue so the wound can heal. So the granulation tissue is the healthy tissue. For the healthy tissue to fill the cavity, the unhealthy tissue or the dead tissue has to be removed. So in summary, even though there are multiple local factors that determine wound healing, and some of them are wound specific, we have focused on three factors which are common to all the wounds. Number one, to ensure optimal local moisture levels. Number two, to examine the wound and to make sure that it's not critically colonized, i.e. there's not a significant level of microbial load which could indicate local wound infection. The management of local wound infection varies amongst different wound care professionals. So you have to address that with your team. Number three, to ensure that there is no non-viable tissue, i.e. no necrotic tissue or slough. If there is slough or necrotic tissue, that has to be excised surgically, i.e. debrided, or one can use different topical wound care products to enhance autolytic debridement or enzymatic debridement of non-viable tissue. That's it for this week. Until we meet next time. Please make sure that you are correctly able to stage the four pressure injury wounds we discussed at the beginning of this presentation. So until we meet next time, take care. Bye for now.